All right, kiddos, welcome back. We're starting a new chapter today. The chapter we're starting is called Reaction Kinetics, or um, it's also known as Rate Law. We're talking about how fast chemical reactions proceed. We're measuring their rate. Now, we're going to begin by talking about something called the collision theory. And the collision theory basically is what it says it is. In order for two molecules or two atoms to react, they must bump into each other. They must collide with each other. So if I expect molecule A2 to react with molecule B2, they have to collide. And when they do, we expect two molecules of AB to be formed. Now, that seems pretty cut and dried, right? All molecules need to do is bump into each other and they'll react. <laughs> In reality, it's much more complicated than that. Most collisions fail to produce products. So you might ask yourself why. Well, let's take a look at the illustration below. Um, this molecule here is carbon monoxide. This molecule here is nitrogen dioxide. Now, in order for a molecule of carbon monoxide to react with a molecule of nitrogen dioxide, they have to collide with each other. However, they need to collide with, with each other in a certain orientation and with enough energy to overcome the repulsive forces that each molecule's electrons are forcing upon the other molecule. So I'll say that again. They need to co collide with each other in the proper orientation and with enough kinetic energy. When that happens, we have something called an effective collision. So in this case, um, the carbon atom in CO must contact the oxygen atom in NO2. Did you catch that? The carbon atom. Now, the carbon atoms are these guys that are these um, sort of navy blue type of spheres. And the oxygens are these um, red spheres here. So you can see in um, the A part of my illustration, I have an oxygen from carbon monoxide bumping into an oxygen from nitrogen dioxide. That's considered to be an ineffective collision because they're not orientated properly. So these guys will just bounce off of each other and they will not react. Now let's take a look at the second scenario. Here we have the oxygen in carbon monoxide colliding with the nitrogen in nitrogen dioxide. Now remember, for an effective collision for this particular reaction, the carbon atom must collide with an oxygen atom in NO2. So once again, this is ineffective, and these two molecules will bounce off of each other. It will be an ineffective collision. Now, let's take a look at uh, scenario C. Here we have the carbon atom in carbon monoxide colliding with an oxygen atom in nitrogen um, dioxide. And when that happens, we form this uh, intermediate activated complex. It, it exists for just a moment. And when it does, you'll notice that that oxygen that the carbon monoxide um, collided with sticks to the carbon atom. And we end up forming carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. So that was an effective collision as far as orientation is considered. Now, take a look at scenario D. In scenario D, the carbon atom is colliding, uh, the carbon atom in carbon monoxide is colliding with an oxygen atom in nitrogen dioxide. But for some reason, they bounce off of each other. They rebound from each other. And that is because there is insufficient energy to form that activated complex. So two things need to happen. They not only need to be orientated properly, but they also have to have sufficient kinetic energy for the activated complex to form. 
So, um, this figure shows four different collisions, orientations between CO and NO2 molecules. The collisions in A and B do not result in a reaction because the molecules are not in a position to form bonds. They're not orientated properly. The molecules in C collide in the correct orientation, and a reaction occurs because they have sufficient energy. Now in D, they're also in the correct orientation, but they have insufficient energy to react. Now, the minimum amount of energy that reactant particles must have to form this activated complex and lead to a reaction is something called the activation energy. And that's symbolized by this capital E sub A. Alrighty? Alright, so a quick summary of the collision theory. Reactant substances, and they could be atoms, ions, or molecules, they must collide. Okay, obviously they've got to bump into each other. Number two, they must collide in the correct orientation. And number three, reacting substances must collide with sufficient energy to form that activated complex. So, let me show you a couple of scenarios here um, of chemical reactions. This one is carbon monoxide reacting with nitrogen dioxide. That's the one that we just saw. If they hit each other in the proper orientation with sufficient energy, they form that activated complex just for a moment, and then they end up forming their products. Now, the y-axis on this graph is energy. And so you can see my reactants have a particular amount of energy stored in their bonds. In order to uh, form the activated complex, we need to add some energy. And that energy that we add is called activation energy. Now, as soon as that activated complex is formed, it decomposes and turns into my products. And when that happens, look, energy is released. In fact, my products end up with less energy than my reactants. And so this would be an example of an exothermic reaction. Energy is released by the reaction, and this would be exothermic. Here, my products have less energy stored in their bonds than my reactants. Notice the activation energy process that required energy. That process was endothermic. But then after that was formed, energy was released. In fact, so much energy was released that my products ended up having less energy than my reactants. Let's look at this other reaction. Let's take carbon dioxide reacting with nitrogen monoxide. So it's actually the reverse of the reaction that we just saw. In this situation, it looks like the oxygen and carbon dioxide needs to bump into the nitrogen and nitrogen monoxide with enough energy to form this activated complex. So my reactants gain energy to form the activated complex. Once again, that energy required is called the activation energy. Now once that's formed, that also decomposes and that can turn into my products, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. Now what's the difference between this reaction and the one we just saw? Yeah, my products have more energy at the end than my reactant started with. So we call these types of reactions, if you recall, endothermic. They require energy. So here, energy would be absorbed by the reaction. Now, the figure below is an energy diagram for a reaction. I want you to take a minute and match the appropriate number with the quantity it represents. So down here you'll see the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I want you to match those numbers up with these vocabulary terms listed underneath example 1. So take a minute, pause the video, try to do that without my help, then come back to the video and we'll see how you did. All right. Welcome back. So let's see, the reactants. Which number represents the reactants? Yeah, if you said number two represents my reactants, you are correct. And this represents the energy that the reactants possess um, before the chemical reaction begins. All right, letter B. Which represents the activated complex? 
Yeah, if you said number three, you are also correct. That is that intermediate um, activated complex that's formed just before it decomposes and turns into my products. And that takes us to letter C, which represents our products. And if you said number four, you are also correct. And finally, the activation energy is the energy required to form the activated complex from my reactants. So number one would be the activation energy of that reaction. Now let me ask you another question before we leave this graph. Is this uh, reaction an example of an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? What do you think? Yeah, if you said endothermic, you were correct. Take a look. My reactants have a certain amount of energy, and my products have more energy, don't they? We had to gain energy in the reaction. So this would be an example of an endothermic reaction. Okay? All right. Now, when we come back for the next video, we're going to list several factors that can determine the rate of a chemical reaction. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.